Good afternoon, Teres. How are you doing? Are you okay? Okay. If we have such a meeting in Africa, in a country like Mali, we will start by doing one thing. When I say TEDx, Mary, Mary, Ma, all of you will say Z O Z. You try it? <laughs> you want to try it? TEDx, Mary, Mary, Ma. Z O Z. Good. TEDx, Mary, Mary, Ma. Z O Z. And when I say everybody, you will say Z. Everybody? Z. Everybody? Z. Everybody? Z. Thank you. In Africa, we do say it is not about where you were born. It's not about where you come from. It's not about where you love to be. But it is that place that is good for you that is your home. You know, when we think about refugees, a lot of images come to our head. We think about boats with a lot of people in it. We think about children lying on the seashore. We think about war, we think about trauma, we think about people who cannot fit into society again. But when we think about refugees, how often do we think about someone like Abraham? About someone like Jesus Christ? Like Moses? Like Mohammed, peace be upon his soul? Like Albert Einstein? How often do we think about our former queen, Princess Beatrice of Oranje. These people were all refugees as well. Imagine they all be in a boat. What are we going to do? <laughs> I also came to Holland as a refugee during the Civil War in Liberia. In Africa, we say, in order to survive in a new country, you have to forget and remember. But what do you need to forget? And what do you need always to remember? My mother always told me, my son, our loved ones who are dead, they are not really dead, but they are alive. They are alive to stand next to us in our journey through earth. My mother, who during the civil war in Liberia was separated from me, fell one afternoon asleep, and she dreamt. In her dream, she saw the spirit of death gradually approaching her house. Which of the children is this spirit coming to carry? She saw me, naked. The AK-47 aimed at my breast. Out of a clump of sweat, she woke up, and she called God to help her. The next morning, I left my hiding opposite the American embassy to search for food. In the whole country, there was nothing more than grass to eat. People were dying from hunger, dehydration, executions. A girlfriend of mine has food. She has food because her friend is a rebel. By previous visit, she gave me something to eat, and I hope that she has something again for me this time. She's happy to see me. She embraces me, she kisses me. We spoke a bit, and she gave me this time three donuts. Happily, I walked back towards my hiding. Her friend suddenly came around the corner. He was holding an AK-47 in his, in his hand, and he said, stop! I'm going to kill you. You are a rebel. Please don't kill me. I'm not a rebel. He hits me with his gun. I fall on the ground. I feel nothing. A strange silence took over my life. And what I found difficult to accept is that I would die on the street and that my parents would never see my body. And he said, stand up. Put off your clothes. Put off your clothes and go and stand as far as possible from me. I once heard that if you stand very far from the rebels, they easily can shoot you. But if you stand very close to them, they do not shoot because they are afraid that the bullet may bounce back and hit them. They do not want your blood to touch them. So I stood up quickly, ran to him, and I begged for my life. And he hit me back. How long we did this dance of death, I do not know. He would hit me back, I would stand up quickly, and I would run towards him. Out of nowhere came a man that I've never seen before and which I may never see anymore in my life. 
And the man asks, what is going on? Crying, I tried to explain, but he said, I know you. I know you. And he asked the Rebbe, please let him go. Who is this man? Why is he been listening to? And why should I leave? I'm standing here today, not because I knew this man, but because he knew me, and he decided to plead for me. He should have been killed for doing this. He had nothing to gain for doing this. Struggling for survival, with my bare feet through difficult paths, longing for a home, crying for grace, came I to this new country, Holland. When I came here, I knew nobody, and nobody knew me. In Africa, we do say, when people do not see you, when people do not want to talk to you, then you are not a stranger, but a dead person. That consciousness of death made me long for life. What did I do? I went to the shop, and with the little money that I got, I bought for myself, now I have to leave the tennis carpet, I went to the shop, and I bought for myself <laughs> a pair of typical Dutch wooden shoes. <laughs> and for more than three years, I would walk through the streets of Holland. I would go to the market, to the job office, to the funeral service, to the schools, to the police. And all of a sudden, everybody started talking to me. They said, look, oh, that's our African once more on the wooden shoes. And they started telling me stories about Holland, about water, about their parents who also walked on wooden shoes. It's not about where you come from. It's not about where you were born. It's not about where you love to be. But it is that place that is good for you that is your home. When I came to Holland, I was living in a refugee camp. Actually, it's not a refugee camp, it's an asylum seeker center. We call it in Holland, Azizuka Centro. In that place, everybody was waiting for their resident permit. I discovered that waiting for your resident permit is sometimes more dangerous than traveling through enemy lines. But from Caravan to caravan, I would go to make pictures of the refugees who were there. I bought a camera and I started making pictures. Whenever I want to make a picture, they would tell me, no, Bright, you can make a picture of me like this. They would go to the second-hand shop, they would buy the most beautiful clothes, and they would tell me, now you can make a picture. And then when I want to make the picture, they would say, no, 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 stop, stop, not here. They would take me to the city. They would look for one of the most beautiful cars, or one of the most beautiful houses, and they will tell me, now you can make a picture of me. So then I make the pictures. Most times, I believe they send it to their family members, but I kept the memory in my brain. And I realized, making these pictures, that refugees want to be seen as people with talents, with potentials, people who can be meaningful to society, people who want to achieve something people with ambition. So I discovered refugees want to be seen differently than the way they are often portrayed in the media. With the profit I made in this, with making this photograph, I started organizing weekly entertainment programs. We would sing, we would dance, we would celebrate. In that center, there was a nurse. Her name is called Grey Zwoz. 
She saw me organizing this program and she said, I know the organizers of a festival in Nijmegen. I'm going to introduce you to them. A year later, I was presenting one of the multicultural festivals in that city. When I stood on the stage and I started interacting with the public in a different language, I thought, if I can do this, I can practice my old profession again. Once more, somebody who knew me and decided to take a step for me. Just that little introduction of Grace Rose gave me the confidence I needed. I did auditions for the theatre school where I was admitted. I had to do some typical Dutch things like the Heisberg from Amsterdam, they call it. <laughs> and I went to the film academy. And during my time at the theatre school, I started working with different organizations busy with cross-cultural bridging. And during this job, I was asked to develop an empowerment project for young refugees. In 2008, I started working with young refugees who were living in the street of Amsterdam. Most of them came to Holland as young, unaccompanied minors. And at the turn of 18, they ended up in prison. One of these young men was Abu Bakr. He was a child soldier from Syria alone. When he came here, he got a temporary resident permit. But three years later, the permit was withdrawn because they said Syria alone is safe. He couldn't go back, but he couldn't stay here. And he was in that condition for more than five years. And he said to me, Bright, if it wasn't for Allah, I would have killed myself. But Allah said, if I commit suicide, I will not go to paradise. And so I would ask him the question, what are you good at? What do you love to do? What were your dreams before you left your country? And Abu Bakr, Abu Bakr told me, my father was a carpenter. If I have the opportunity, I want to be a carpenter like my father. And so I started looking for volunteers to join me in doing this job because I couldn't do it alone. And one of our volunteers found somebody and now Abu Bakr has somewhere to start practicing carpentry. It's no longer roaming the street. But most of the young people I met then told me, Bright, if you really want to help us, please meet us in the asylum center. Don't come to us when we are already roaming the street. So in 2013, I went to the asylum seeker center and I started an empowerment program. When I got there, what I saw was heartbreaking. I saw young men, 18, 19, 20, doing nothing the whole day. They would be sleeping until five o'clock in the afternoon. When I asked them, why are you doing nothing? They said to me, Bright, when I see people going to school, when I see people going to their jobs, it gets me mad because I think about the future that I've lost. And I understand that. Because sometimes as a refugee, you don't want to look to the future because it hurts. You don't want to look to the past because it hurts. And then I decided that we have to find a structural solution to this problem. Since this year, I've started what I call the Future Academy, the Tukums Academy. And my dream is in every city in Holland to have a Tukums Academy where young refugees can work on their personal development, their professional development, and meet people like you and me. So if you are sitting in this hall and you think, what can I do? You can do a lot. You and me can do a lot to give refugees their values back again. I would like to end up with this little poem. It's not about where you come from, not about where you were born. It's that place that is good for you that is your home. When I left my father's house, the only thing that I longed for was to meet you. You who is not afraid to open your heart and your soul for me. You who dare to embrace an outcast like me. And thanks to you, I no longer want to imprison myself 
in prison myself because of all that I find difficult to tell. I no longer want to run, run from a world I do not understand. I no longer want to be afraid, afraid of the dark, afraid of the night, afraid to be cast out. Thanks to you, I can make all my crooked paths straight, my dirty river sweet. Thanks to you, I can fly once more as a dove. Thank you.